All right, well, we're starting a new series, uh, The Shed Blood of Jesus, as you can see. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at this for several weeks, and uh, in, uh, in a few weeks, uh, we're going to be looking over, uh, unquestionably, the most important uh, event that uh, has ever happened on the face of this earth and ever will, and that's when the Word became flesh, and Jesus came to this earth, and He walked uh, as a sin-free man. Uh, he was unblemished. Uh, it was His choice. Uh, to go uh, to that cross to submit himself to, to death, uh, fulfilling the requirements of the Passover lamb that was really foreshadowed all through the Old Testament. Now, through the shedding of the Messiah's blood, uh, we are left with a choice. And uh, matter of fact, this goes along, I don't know where Judy's at, but this goes along with what I was listening to your, in your class today, that uh, we do have a choice uh, to be reconciled to God, um, to be reconciled to Every blessing that he has for our life that was uh, once given over to Satan back in that, uh, back in that, that garden. And uh, God has a desire for every single person here. And you've got to understand that. Every single person personally, if God was here, he would look at every single one of you individually and say, I've got a very plan for your life. Not just corporately. He does have a, a corporate will for his church, for fellowships and everything. But every single person here, he has a will, which a will is his desire. He has a will for every single person here. And I love how he speaks about this uh, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. And uh, catch this, he says here, today I have given you a choice between life or death, between blessings or cursing. So every single person here, okay, you're given a choice today. You have a free will, and God is saying to his people back in, in Deuteronomy, he said, hey, I'm giving you a choice, and he's giving you a choice today, the same thing, that you can choose this very day, whether you're going to live with life, whether you're going to live with death, whether you're going to live in blessings, whether you're going to live in cursings. It says, now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you shall make. So again, he's saying, earth, listen up. These people are going to make a choice. What's it going to be? And he's looking at every single person here going, are you going to choose life or are you going to choose death? Are you going to choose to, to think of yourself as walking in the cursings that came at the fall of man? Or are you going to choose that I am not going to walk in the cursings any longer, but because the blood of Jesus, I've been set free, and I'm going to walk in life. I'm going to walk in, in blessings. And then I love how this context here uh, plays out here in, in this version. I believe this is a New Living version because it really makes God uh, sound like uh, a true person of who he is, that, a person that has a, emotions. So he says, what are you going to choose? And then he says, oh, that you would choose life. And I can just see God look, looking at every single person here saying, you know what, Stan, you've got a choice. You can choose this day to walk in blessings or cursings. And oh, I sure hope you make the right choice. I sure hope that you choose life so that you and your descendants might live. And the key that we have right here as we take a look at this is we have a free will. Every single one of us has a choice. He's not forcing us to make a choice. He's giving us the option saying, I'm letting it be up to you. What do you want to choose? How do you want to live? And you've got a choice, again, whether it's going to be blessings or cursings. Now, as we move into the new covenant, it's the same thing. He still has the same will, the same desire some thousand years later. In 2 Peter 3, 9, he says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, promise of judgment, okay, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or is patient towards us. And then it goes on here and it says, he is not willing, okay, he has a will and his will is not, okay, that anybody should perish. Okay, but the all should come to repentance. So again, God has a blessed will for every single person here. And he doesn't want anybody to perish. And when we look at that word perish, yes, it does mean not go to hell. God doesn't want any person, any person that's ever walked in the face of this earth, he's never looked and said, I want you to go to hell. His desire for every single person, everyone here, is that everyone here knows who his son is, knows that, know that Jesus is the Messiah, know that Jesus did fulfill everything he needed to fulfill, the requirements of the, the Passover, that when we apply the blood of Jesus to our life, that we are set free from, from perishing, from going to hell. And he says, I want everybody that's ever walked in the face of this earth to understand that. He says, but that everyone should come to repentance. And what does repentance mean? Repentance is talking about just changing your mind is what it means. So many times we think repentance has to do with, with, with turning from sin and that kind of stuff, and that's part of it. But really, repentance is just talking about changing your mind. In fact, the Bible says a few times in Scripture that even God repented. 
Okay, it doesn't mean that God is repenting from sin. It means that God, because a mankind changed his mind, like in Jonah, and, uh, with, with Nineveh, and, and even with Moses, that uh, because they changed their mind, God says, okay, I won't bring destruction on you anymore. So what repentance means is you're just changing your mind. You're changing your mind from a mindset of, I'm going to depend upon myself, to God, I'm changing my mind that I am going to depend upon you. I'm going to depend upon your grace. I'm going to depend upon your righteousness for my very life. Now, here's the catch, though, for the whole thing. Again, he does have a will for your life, and his will is that every person here would find salvation. But again, we've got to receive it, we've got to believe it, and our will has to submit to God's will in order for this thing to take place, not only for your salvation, and this is what I want you to see today. It's not just for salvation, but it's for a completion of victory. It's so that you can live a victorious Christian life, not in the by and bys when you leave this world, but right now, right here, as you walk upon the face of this earth in this life today, okay, that you can live in victory, that every area of your life, God's will for you is that you live in completion, that you live in fulfillment, that you live according to every blessing that he has already bestowed upon you. Now, 1 Timothy 2.4 I want to dig into this for just a minute and kind of let this be maybe uh, the, the, the key scripture here that I want you to see. And there's one word that I want you to take a look at today. It says that God's desire, or God's desires, all men to be saved, okay? And I put uh, what word that is, is word sozo. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, when we take a look at this word that God desires all men to be saved, most of us look at this and go, okay, um, salvation or saved, it's talking about, you know, when we die from this earth, uh, there's, there's going to be an eternity for us with God because we've applied the blood of Jesus, that kind of thing. And that's part of what, what saved is, but to the full extent of what saved is, not only does it mean salvation for the future, okay, but, but there's more to it than this. And as we look at this word sozo right here, what the word sozo is talking about um, as you can see right here, it does talk about uh, some different places there. It's talking about a messianic uh, fulfillment and, and that kind of thing, as you can see down below here. But what I want you to see here, this is really what sozo means, if you can see that down below. It says to make whole. Okay, so when it's, he says that, I want you to be saved, okay, it's not just for salvation. I mean, that's the, one of the greatest things of salvation, you know, for eternity, but, but it's even more than that. What he's saying is, I want you to be completely whole. I don't want you just to be just looking at your salvation when you die, but I want you to look at your life right now. And this is why Jesus came in John 10, 10, and he says this, that I have come in order that you might have life and life to its fullness. That's the promise that Christ has given to every person here, that you would have the fullness, not just in heaven. That's not what it's talking about. But he's talking the fullness right here upon this earth. Now, just because you have submitted your life to Christ and you are saved for eternity, okay, um, the devil's not going to leave you alone, will he? Hello? Everybody know that? He's going to continue to fight. He's not going to leave you alone. And his desire, even though... You've been under the blood of Jesus, okay, and your eternal destination is, is, is going to heaven and that kind of stuff. His desire still is that he wants to still steal, kill, and destroy your very life here on this earth. And he's not just going to give you a bypass because Jesus is becoming your Lord. He's going to fight even harder to destroy your life. And he does this by trying to control our minds. And here's what he does. He limits our understanding of what this very term saved is all about. He says, okay. Let them believe that they're saved, okay? But, but let them think that, that salvation is just talking about in, in the by and bys when they leave. Let them not understand the fullness to what this whole thing is, that there is a continuous flow of the blood of Jesus in everybody's life here to set you free from every curse that has ever come against, this, uh, against mankind that even took place in the garden. That has all been removed, but the devil's speaking in your mind, says, don't let them understand that. Let them just be focused on eternity, but let them suffer in this life. Let's steal their joy in this life. Well, in Scripture, the, Satan's called many things, and uh, I want to look at the book of Revelation for just a minute. God gives us insight about how Satan works and how he tries to keep you and I still bound in this whole incompletion to where we think that we're still 
part of the curse and all this kind of stuff. Revelation verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 10, I should say. Here's some pages turning there. Are you there? You there? Say I'm there. Okay, verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, As it has come at last, salvation, power, and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ. Then it goes on here and it says, For the accuser. Everybody say accuser. Okay, this is one of the names that Satan has. He is the accuser. The accuser of our brothers and sisters. Who's the brothers and sisters he's talking about here? Every single person here. The brothers and sisters of Christ. So he's accusing every single one of you. Okay, so again, the accusers of the brothers and sisters have been thrown down to earth. And again, this is, this is future tense, okay? So again, he's still there accusing you right now. It says, the one that, who accuses them before God day and night. But then here's the good news. It says, and they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. So the first thing that I want to take a look at here is what his name is. He is the accuser. And I think it's crazy that uh, he's accusing you of curses and all this kind of stuff before God day and night. I'm always wondering, you know, is, is God like, would you just shut up man? turn this guy off? I mean, he's in God's face, according to this, day and night, saying, you know, this is what's going on. Isaac, this is what Isaac did today, God. Okay, Isaac blew it today. You should have seen what he did today. Wow, and God, can, let me tell you a little bit more about him. You think God, after a while, would go, shut up. Get out of my face. But that's what he's saying. It's, he's accusing us of, of different things. And since he's lost your soul uh, from, from going to hell, and now you're going to heaven because of what Jesus Christ did, if you've submitted to Jesus Christ, Again, his goal is this, that he wants to destroy these redeemed blessings by feeding your mind full of accusations. And that's what he's doing. As he is accusing you before God, those accusations are going on in your mind as well. You know what I'm talking about? Hello? I mean, you ever have those thoughts going on in your mind? Those thoughts that are from the pit of hell? Oh, you know what? You'll, you'll be in poverty the rest of your life. Your grandpa was in poverty. Your dad was in poverty. You're going to be in poverty as well. You're never going to get above a certain level. You ever heard of this one? Uh, once an alcoholic, always, always an alcoholic. And even Christians, we buy into that going, oh, I guess I'm just an alcoholic. I'll never get over it. I'll always have this sickness all my life. Again, these are thoughts going on. Oh, your family, your family had cancer. Your, your dad died of cancer. Your grandma died of cancer. So probably you're going to get cancer. Just, just, just expect that you're going to die of cancer. And again, these thoughts are going through your mind. I'm Irish. That's why I've got a temper. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to have fits of rage every once in a while because that's just genetically who I am. I mean, these are going through your mind. I'm, I'm not smart enough to get this degree. I'll never be healed from this disease. I'll never find a spouse. Nobody wants me. I'll never have a fi family, so I might as well just give up. And boom, 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 all these thoughts are just ringing through your mind all the time. These accusations about who you are. Listen, stop listening to that. And stop listening to the, maybe the facts about this world because the fact of the matter isn't half as important as the truth of the matter. The truth of the matter is what's important. Quit listening to accusations because every curse that was once upon you has now been removed, every one of them. That's why Jesus died, not just for your salvation, but to remove every single curse that the devil tries to put against you that came upon at the fall of man. It's gone, it's abolished. He removed it. And how do you come these curses that he continues to, to accuse you of? Back to Revelation 12, 10. Better back to verse 11. It says, and they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. First of all, God did his part. The blood of the lamb was sacrificed. And what's our part? By our testimony. You guys with me? I don't hear a lot of amen. I want to tell you, this, this is good preaching, okay? <laughs> I'm preaching a lot better than you're amening. Okay, I just want you to know that. This is, this is life here, okay? It says we overcome by our testimony that when we hear these accusations in our mind, okay, we replace them and say, you know what? I am not cursed any longer. 
I am free. I am set free by the blood of the lamb. I am no longer under poverty. I am no longer under sickness. And by our testimony as we shout them in the heavens that I am set free. That's how we overcome. See, the blood of Jesus isn't only for forgiveness, but it's for every single blessing so that we can live a life of fullness because we've already been set free from the curse. Jesus says in John 8, 36, he says, therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. If you've received the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice, you are, all, are already free. There's nothing more that God has to do for you. He set you free. And it's by our testimony, by our belief that we are free. Now, again, as I just said, you're already free. He paid the price, okay? He paid an extremely high price for your freedom. But the fact is this, that you can choose not to believe. And again, that's what God said, but I read that before. He says, it's your choice. You can choose. You can choose either blessings or cursings. You can choose either life or death. It's up to you, God said. I'm not gonna force you, God says, to believe in it. And you can believe that you're saved from hell, and that's great, but you can continue to live a life of cursing upon this world. It's up to you of what you're going to believe. You can still live in a life of bondage even though he set you free from the curse. Do you know that, uh, kind of switching the subject here, do you know, you know, you know what a flea is, those little fleas that jump off your dog? Do you know you can train those little guys? You can. Take a look at a second. Training fleas requires a glass jar with a lid. The fleas are placed inside the jar and the lid is then sealed. They are left undisturbed for three days. Then, when the jar is opened, the fleas will not jump out. In fact, the fleas will never jump higher than the level set by the lid. Their behavior is now set for the rest of their lives. And, when these fleas reproduce, their offspring will automatically follow their example. Well, we take a look at this, and uh, of course, the lid's put on, lid's removed. The fleas, they're, they've got the ability to jump out. I don't know how far fleas can jump, but they can probably jump a couple feet, can't they? Huh, you dog owners? <laughs> I am now dogless. It was hard at first. Now I'm thanking God. But, uh <laughs> but fleas can jump a long ways. I mean, what was that, maybe eight inches? They have the ability to jump out, don't they? Their offspring certainly have the ability to jump out. The lid has been released. They are free. And come on, be truthful with me. When you're watching that, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, those stupid little fleas. <laughs> Weren't you? I did the same thing going, oh, those, those pathetic little things. They don't have brains in their head, right? What do you think the devil says when he looked at us? I heard that. Look at those stupid little people. We put a lid over top of them. We keep giving them accusation after accusation. Jesus comes. He sets them free. And look at these stupid little people. I'm not telling you they're stupid. But that's probably what the devil's looking, going, look at them. Hey, demons, look at this. They're set free. The door's open, and they're still living under the curse. Let's let them believe that this whole thing is just about salvation, but let's, let's just continue to, to give them the accusations that they're still under the curse, so at least this life they're going to be destroyed. They're going to live in bondage because, look, they're not trying to jump out. They, they're believing us. And Jesus is saying, I remove the lid. Jump out. You're free. And here we are. We believe that we're saved but we don't comprehend this whole word sozo. The so word sozo is this word that, that means saved. When you look at that we've been saved, okay, that the word sozo is, is the Greek term, and this Greek term sozo is talking about that we have been set free to the fullness. 
It's not just talking about salvation. It's talking about every single blessing that you are sozo, that you are, you are set free to receive the completion. The completion of who that we were before the fall. When everything was so good and perfect. So if we continue to, to listen to these accusations, and we, do, we can. And we can sit there and think, you know what? We're still cursed. We walk in a cursed earth and all that kind of, and we, we can think that whole thing. And the fact is this, that yes, we do live in a cursed world still, but you are not cursed. When Jesus died on the cross, when he shed his blood, the power of his blood set you free from everything, from all the curses, so so that you are completely made whole. But it's what you believe in your mind is what you're, how you're going to behave. Scripture says this in Proverbs 23, 7. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So again, you've got a choice of what you're going to believe. You can believe the facts that, yes, we were once cursed, that kind of thing. Or you can believe the truth that now I am free. And that's the whole point of this sermon series that we're going to be looking at the next several weeks. I want you to see and to comprehend the whole truth that the blood of Jesus Even though forgiveness is a great thing, no question about that, but it's more than forgiveness. His blood was the the payment of the, the, the ransom, the redemptive price, okay? That's the ultimate price, okay? He didn't just pay a, a, a small portion. He paid the ultimate price, and he paid the ultimate price to set you free. So you could buy somebody. You could go to a slave auction, and you could buy somebody to be your slave. And you would still be a slave. But you could also come and you could pay a redemptive price for somebody. And a redemptive price was the ultimate price that you'd pay somebody. And the redemptive price means that you buy somebody out of slavery. That's your, they're no longer your slave. They're no longer anybody's slave. That they are free. And that's what it took place. That he paid the redemptive price. That there is nothing that you are in bondage to any longer. See, one of the results of redemption is forgiveness, but again, forgiveness is just one fruit of redemption. It's not the fullness of redemption. The fullness of redemption by his blood, again, I'm trying to get you to understand this, is everything that that was put under the curse at the fall, everything has been released back to you. Every blessing has been brought back to you, given back to you. And as we look in the Garden of Eden before the fall, there was no stress. There was no confrontation. No depression, there is no sadness, there is no disease, there is no eternal death, there is no struggle for provisions and wealth, there is no greed, there is no selfishness, there is no anger, there is no strife, there is no bitterness, there is no hatred, there is no abuse of yourself or abuse of others. None of that was taking place. And if you're struggling with one of those issues right now, you've got to realize again, the lid, the curse of the lid have been lifted off of you. Quit living inside the jar of cursings. Because again, the blood has set you free. And Jesus is saying, receive it. I did not die in vain, he's saying. Receive it to its fullness. So if you're struggling with some of these issues, what we need to do is acquire the knowledge of the power of the blood of Jesus and not limit it just to our eternal destination, but to everything uh, uh, functioning in this life, every blessing that you can have in this life. I'm going to turn to Hosea, if you want to turn to Hosea 4.6. And he says here, speaking through the prophet Hosea, he said, my people who are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that's what the devil's trying to do to every person here. If you've understood the blood of Jesus for salvation, okay, it's a lack of knowledge that you don't go any further. And again, I'm not trying to take away anything to do with forgiveness because it's a great thing that he has done for us, but it's much more than that. But again, we can't limit it just to our eternal destination. But it goes on here and says, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being a priest for me. Okay, now stop right there because maybe some of you are going, well, I'm not a priest. Yes, you are. If, you're, if you've been bought by the blood of Jesus and his righteousness is upon you, it says that you are now part of a holy priesthood, a holy nation, that we are called to Offer up spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing and acceptable to God. So again, you are part of this priesthood. And again, this, I know this is Old Testament, but it's going to transfer to the New Testament here in just a minute. It says, I will also reject you from being my priest because you have forgotten the law of your God. 
Now let me just explain this a minute, okay? If we don't comprehend and apply biblical knowledge, what's going to happen is we're going to continue to walk in the, 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 the curse of destruction. And as we walk in the curse of destruction, okay, we're not going to fulfill our heavenly call as priests because, again, he's saying here that you won't apply the pattern of God. Now, let me just talk about the pattern of the law of God here for just a minute. The written law was a shadow of things to come so we can look in the Old Testament and see that the patterns, the principles, and they transfer to the, the new covenant, okay, not physically, but spiritually, okay? In the Old Testament, it was a physical observance of the law. But again, as Jesus has fulfilled that by his blood, okay, this shadow has become reality that he has become the substance when he paid the price for the curse of the law is what the Bible says. Again, the pattern of the law is still there, but it's went from the physical to the spiritual. Now, as priests, luckily it has switched from the physical to the spiritual, because I want to tell you, I, I'm, I would not be looking forward to being a priest in the Old Testament. Do you know how much uh, blood they had to spill? In a couple weeks, we're going to be uh, um, having uh, our, our Passover meal here, and uh, we have a lamb that's been growing up all year. Uh, that that we will um, that we'll have to kill. I haven't seen it. Uh, I've been invited to go see it. I'm like, I don't even know if I want to go see it. Just the thought of of having to kill a little lamb is is difficult. Okay, As a matter of fact, uh, just a little bunny trail here in the Old Testament. They would have to have the lamb in their household before they killed it, so that they know it was a sacrifice. But uh, luckily, we don't have to do that anymore. Again, this, by the way, uh, if you want to come to uh, the, the, the Passover meal, it's, it's really an interesting thing to see how Jesus fulfilled uh, the pattern of the Passover lamb to every jot and tittle. It's really cool, plus the food is really good, so you're invited to come. But, but again, we're not Old Testament any longer. We don't have to kill a lamb. But what we have to do now, because it's switched spiritually, is we have to apply it spiritually. Now take a look at this, uh, talking about the law, because I want you to see that the law is a shadow to come, because again, we can... We, can, we, we must look at the pattern of the old and apply it to the new because, again, the pattern doesn't change. Again, it just went from physical uh, to, to the spiritual. Colossians 2.16, talking about the law, he says, So let no one judge you in the food or in the drink or regarding the festivals and the moons or the Sabbath. Okay, Talking about physically looking at the law. And then he goes on here in verse 17, he says, Which are shadows of things to come, but the substance is Christ. It goes on here in Hebrews 10, again, talking about a shadow. He says, the old system under the law of Moses was a shadow, a dim preview of good things to come. What was the good things to come? That there was going to be a Messiah that was going to shed his blood someday. Okay? Not the good things themselves. Okay, So again, the, 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 the Mosaic law was not the good things itself. The good thing was come. It was just a shadow. It was, it was a pattern of the things to come. And again, the pattern is still there. We can still look at the pattern. But again, we apply it spiritually. Okay, and I'll wrap this up in just a minute here. Okay, it goes on, it says, the sacrifices under that system, the old system, were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing uh, for those who came to worship. Okay, saying this, that in the Old Testament, okay, they would bring a lamb or whatever, and they would, they would slay the lamb, okay, the blood would go everywhere, and whether it be for a guilt offering or whatever it might be, peace offering or whatever, they would, the blood would shed. They would leave, okay, and I don't know, maybe a day later they would, they would do something again. Go, oh, back they go, and they would have to do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And it was, it was a bloodbath. But to understand this whole idea of sozo, this word salvation or save to the fullness, okay, that comes through the blood of Jesus, okay, we've got to still understand the Old Testament pattern here. Now, the Old Testament pattern, again, the law of Moses is a shadow. But you know what they truly understood that we miss? They understood about the blood sacrifice. Oh, they understood it. And they saw blood shed, I mean, spread all over the place all the time. You went to the old, uh, the, the outer court, man, and it was, again, it was a bloodbath. Now, under the old system, the Mosaic law, what they would understand is the blood sacrifice was for more than just atonement. Okay, now really two times a year, uh, they, they did the atoning thing during Passover and during the Day of Atonement. Okay, they would do that. But, but during the rest of the year, they would still do sacrifices. Why? Because the blood is not just for salvation. 
but it's for the release of every spiritual blessing. So when they needed mercy, they would go and they would, they would, they would splatter the blood. When they needed to hear from God, they would go and they'd splatter the blood before the veil. When they needed healing, peace, a miracle, they would go and, and, and give a blood offering. When they needed power and protection, they would go and make a blood offering and they would, they would put it on the horns of the altar. They understood again that, that the blood was just for more than just the salvation and atonement. And again, what the old system foreshadowed to us, again, that, that this pattern stays the same. And we just apply it now spiritually. But again, the blood, you've got to understand that the blood is for more than just salvation. The blood is for this life as well. And that's what the shadow of the Old Testament tells us. And it's more than just forgiveness. That when we spiritually apply the pattern of the blood, what happens is every spiritual blessing that God has already given to us, that the will of God that's in heaven is already done in heaven, that needs to be released from heaven to this earth, okay? When we apply the blood, okay, it releases those spiritual blessings, not just for salvation, but for your blessings upon this world as well. And the good news is this, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was done once and for all. You don't need to go and reapply it. You know what we need to do? We need to remember it, and we need to give thanks for it. Hebrews 10.10 says this, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands ministering daily, talking about the old covenant, the old system. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which they can never take away sin which I just talked about. But this man talking about Jesus, the Messiah, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of, of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made at his footstool by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sac san sanctified. One offering. Again, we don't have to go and reapply it. And you know what? I, I make a mistake once in a while I was doing that, going, let's reapply the blood. Wait a minute. And Jesus is probably going, wait a minute. I thought you already, you already applied my blood. I'm not going to come down and, and die again. My blood has already been applied to your life. It's already set you free. It's past tense. I've already done it. You just remember it and just give thanks for it. See, the, the time that we need to apply the blood, and if there's anybody in this place right now that has never applied the blood of Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, the true Passover lamb, today is the day of salvation. And you need to come before God today and say, God, I've been trying to live this life of righteousness on my own. And that was the whole idea of the law before is that you could never do righteousness on your own. And if that's you today, I've been trying to figure this thing out on my own, doing good and all this kind of stuff on my own. And you come to that conclusion today that there's no way I can do it. I have to have the righteousness of Christ because he's the one that fulfilled the law. Again, today is the day of salvation. And it's time for you to fall down in the, at the feet of Jesus, like the song we sang today, and say, Jesus, I need your blood. I need to apply your blood to the sin of my life. Not that your blood is going to cover my sin, but it's going to remove it as far as east is from the west. So that's the time we apply that blood. But after we apply the blood, again, what I said is, the thing that we need to do is remember that the blood has been applied. When we have stress in our life, Remember the blood. When we have guilt in our life, remember the blood. When we have temptations coming in our life, remember the blood. When we have fear in our life, we remember the blood. When we have hurts in our life, we remember the blood. See, again, Jesus is not going to return as a Passover lamb again. The next time he comes, he's coming for judgment. He's coming as a lion of Judah. He's not coming as this little lamb that went to the cross. He's already applied his blood. He has already, and let me make this a verb, he's already sozoed you, okay? He's already given you fulfillment, okay? He's already given you completion already. He shed his blood many, many ways for everything that you need to live a victorious Christian life. Not in heaven. I mean, yes, in heaven, but even more on this earth right now. Now back to the old system of this blood offering. In Leviticus, again, it's a shadow of good things to come, and he's given instruction here about this atonement sacrifice, and this is kind of an interesting thing here. Leviticus 16, verse 14. It goes on here and it says, He shall take some of the blood of the bulls and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat. And he's talking about the high priest here. 
okay, on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of, or sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, you get the picture. He's sprinkling. Then it goes on verse uh, 18 or so, uh, I think 15 through 18. It says a few more things that, that the priest had to do as he's sprinkling this blood. Okay, But what I want you to see again in verse 19, it goes on again. It says, then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on his finger seven times. Cleanse it, consecrate it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. Okay, And the interesting point that I want to bring up here for just a moment here is, again, the blood is sprinkled seven times. What's the significance of this whole seven? Now, I've said before that the Greek word for saved is this word sozo. And sozo is talking about the fullness. It's talking about completion. Okay, it's, it's, it's talking about you now have everything you need, again, to live the victorious Christian life, okay? The number seven has really the same symbolic meaning as what the word sozo or saved is. It's symbolic for the meaning of completion. That's what seven is. I mean, think about it. God created the, this earth, okay? Basically, in all in seven days is what he created the earth for, okay? Our weeks are in seven days. At the end of the seventh day, it's complete, right? Okay, even, even deeper than this, okay? Uh, any music people in here? We've got a few musical people in here, okay? Playing the piano, okay? There's, there's different octaves. There it is. How many keys are in one octave? Seven, seven keys, okay? Uh, there, there's not an eight. You can sit there and try to pound on it and go over whatever you want, but if you go to the eighth and you go to this note here, it's going to be off, okay? There are seven octaves, okay, when it comes to music. Is that right, Penny? Amen? Okay. Now I'll go to your, your husband. <laughs> How many known elements are there, you geologists? Okay, the, the foundation, as you can see right here, the periodic table of chemical elements. I'm trying to sound real smart here, okay? There's, there's seven of them, okay, as you can see there. Okay, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I'll tell you what, a lot of rocket scientists want to be like me, okay? So, <laughs> just kidding. My smarts comes from looking things up on the internet, okay? But uh, anyway, there's seven known elements within the, the world, okay? It makes up our, our, our globe here, okay? Now, looking at elements, the Earth's minerals are made up of seven crystals. Okay, there's the crystals right there, seven. There's not eight, there's seven, okay? And when you take a look at the crystals and you shine a light through a crystal, how many colors come out of the crystal? Seven, okay? I mean, everything we see, okay, created uh, for completion, okay, is created really in the pattern of seven, so many things. Okay, so again, light has seven colors. Who is the light of the world? I'll help you with the hard ones, John 12, 46. <laughs> I have come into this world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Matter of fact, if you really want to take a look at the completion of the seven parts of light is the establishment of a covenant that God makes with mankind. After Noah gets off the flood, what's God say in Genesis 9, 13? I set my rainbow. How many colors are in the rainbow? Seven. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be the sign of a covenant between me and the earth, okay? Actually, the Hebrew word for oath, okay, is talking about this word shava, and shava is actually meaning the, the number seven, or seven oneself is really what, what the term is all about. See, when we examine the number seven, what it means is it means fullness, it means completion, it means covenant, it means oath, okay? And this is a good reason why Many theologians interpret this whole idea when that high priest went in and he shook his finger seven times, splattering the blood seven times because what he was doing was he was splattering seven as a number of completion. He didn't just do it one time for salvation, for atonement, but he did it seven times because he was making this atonement complete is what he was doing. Now, last year we had a sermon series called uh, Jot or Tittle. Remember that? For those who were here. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 18, as he's looking at the Mosaic law, which he would have been looking at part of this thing where the atonement was made seven times. And Jesus looks at the law and he says, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth has passed away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it's fulfilled. Now, I think that this is probably a pretty significant thing by shaking your finger seven times and splattering on the mercy seat. I mean, it's repeated. And I think Jesus, of course, would have known that because he wrote the Bible. <laughs> Okay? And when he said, I'm going to fulfill it to every jot and tittle, I don't think he would have missed that tittle. The law was specific. Sprinkle it seven times. And that's why the conclusion of many, many theologians today, which I am one, think that 
Jesus fulfilled this whole thing as he went to the cross. See, Jesus' blood, when he went to the cross that day, wasn't just shed one place. Jesus' blood was shed, as we look in the Bible, seven different places during that day. I think he was fulfilling this very, very thing. See, each time he began to bleed that day, he was redeeming more and more and more back for you and for me as he was making that path up to Golgotha until the final time when he stretched out his arms and he looked down at everybody and he looked up at God and said, it is finished. Was he looking at God saying, thank you, Father, that I finally get to leave and go back to heaven. That's finished. Is that what he's saying? He was saying, it is finished, meaning this, that it is complete. Their restoration is complete. I have done everything for them, not only for salvation, but for everything in their life. The curse that had come upon them at the the garden is no longer. It is finished. They said, I need to do nothing more for my creation. I've done it all. There's nothing more that Jesus has to do for you. He has given you every spiritual blessing in heaven. It's already yours. It's whether we can comprehend the power of his blood. Now get this, okay? And and this is where I'm going to end here today. You're going to get a little early today. How about that? Make up for all the times I went over. The first place that we lost the blessing of God was where at? Garden? Somebody say garden. Okay. Yeah, garden. Okay, I'll help you. Okay. I'm not trying to set you up to, to make you embarrassed. It was in the garden, right? Adam and Eve were in the garden. They had every spiritual blessing. And they chose to say no to God. And because they said no to God, okay, the curses came upon them. The blessings were given away. Now get this. Where was the first place that Jesus bled? In the garden. I don't think it was just by coincidence that he was in that garden that night. And drops of blood, because he was stressing out so much, were coming off of his head. And worship team, I'm just about ready to close here. If you want to come up, you can. So again, the first place that he bled was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He redeemed, get this, he redeemed our ability to say yes to God. Because in the garden, Adam and Eve said no to God. And because he's redeemed this, again, we, we can stand before God right now and say, God, I choose to submit to you. I am no longer under that curse anymore. And I say yes to you, God. He's redeemed that ability for you. The second place that he was shedding his blood out was at the whipping post. And he got stripes upon his back. You know what he was redeeming then? Anybody know the scripture? By his stripes, what? We are healed. He was redeeming us from the curse of sickness and disease. By his stripes, again, as he's going to this cross, he's just collecting, okay, I'll take that back, I'll take back, I'll take that back, I'll take that back, I'll take that back. He was making it complete, sozo. He was making the whole fullness of redemption for you. Sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. One, two, three, the third place was this, the crown on his head. He bled from his head. What happened in the garden? Right after the, happened in the garden, okay, the whole thing in the garden happened, um, there was, there was toil and there was painful labor that came upon mankind. And this is my version of this, but essentially God told Adam, you know what, by the sweat of your brow, Adam, you are now going to go into those thorns and you're going to work your tail off God, to, in, just in order to, to, to make anything to, to, to provide for your family. Now Jesus went and said, okay, give me those thorns. I'll put it on my brow. He put it on his brow and the blood came down. Again, redeeming you from that curse. Giving you the ability to not have to to labor so hard in order just to earn a little bit here and a little bit there. He he went to the cross to to provide for you. So you're no longer in poverty. The fourth place, okay, as he's shedding that blood was out Golgotha, and this time it's in his hands. And what's he redeeming there? He's redeeming our spiritual dominion over this earth. And that's why we're told now to lay your hands upon the sick. Let them be healed. We have spiritual dominion now. He's redeemed the work of our hands. The fifth place as he's shedding his blood, again, is Golgotha. And this time, it's going through his feet. And again, the the hands were spiritual dominion, but the feet are a physical dominion. 
he has restored our physical dominion over this world. And listen, the devil is going to continue to tell you, no, I have dominion. No, he doesn't. You have been bought with the price. You have been restored. You now have physical dominion. When God put Adam and Eve upon this earth, he said, you now have dominion over all the earth. Satan took that away. But God's desire all along is that you would have dominion over this earth. Matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 11, 24, he says, every place on which the sole of your feet tread shall be yours. He has bought Brett back your right to have dominion over this earth. Sixth place on the cross is that spear that went into his side, redeeming the curse of internal hurts. The seventh place is when he bled internally. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was bleeding internally for our iniquities. Iniquity is that weakness inside that's been passed down from generation to generation to generation that causes us to sin and turn away from God. And God redeemed us from the generational curses. Seven ways that Jesus bled on his way to Golgotha. See, it wasn't just about salvation, even though that's a large part of it. But he redeemed you with his blood. Sozo so that you have the fullness, you have completion. And again, it says that he loved you so much that he loved you with outstretched arms. And when he hung on that cross again, he looked down at the people that were looking back at him. And he looked at them and says, it is finished. You are no longer under the curse. I have completed you. I have fulfilled it in every single way. But then he looks at you and says, but you've got a choice. Are you going to choose blessings? Or are you going to continue to choose cursings? Are you going to choose life? Or are you going to choose death? And as I started this thing out earlier, God looks at you and says, oh, oh, please choose the right one. Choose life. I didn't die in vain for you. I did it to fulfill everything for you. And I've given it back to you. Now walk in the fullness. Amen? We stand up and pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, the power of your blood is so amazing. Your word says, God, that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My prayer, God, for everybody is hearing this message right now that's sitting in this place, that's watching on the internet, that'll be watching by DVD or whatever. My prayer is these people will not be destroyed for their lack of knowledge. But God, they would truly understand the fullness of your power. That there is a river, a river of your blood that continues to flow. And Father, it has bought our fullness back, our completion. I thank you, God, for salvation. And I pray today, God, as we have our heads bowed and eyes closed right now, as people are thinking about their lives right now, if there's anybody in this place right now, I would say I've never applied the blood of Jesus to my sin. Therefore, I am still in sin because I've been trying to live it, the righteousness by myself. Is there anybody in that place today? Again, today is a day of salvation. And I want you to pray right now and listen to the Holy Spirit right now speak to you. I want you to pray, Jesus, I want your blood to be applied to my life. That my sin is not just covered up, but has washed away as far as the east is from the west. Now, right now, I submit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Thank you for dying for me. But you've got to understand, if you just prayed that prayer, Jesus has so much more for you. And for everybody here that's already done that, he has so much more for you. He has given you every spiritual blessing. And he did that because of the power of the blood. Today, receive it and testify to that. Speak it out that no longer am I going to listen to the accusations of the evil one, but today, oh God, I'm going to cry out for what you've done for me, that you have set me free. Hallelujah, Lord. Set these people free. Just a moment here. Just, I just feel like uh, we just need to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to some of you right now. Just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me right now? 
perhaps there's areas in your life right now that you are in bondage to. Maybe it's some substance abuse, I don't know. Maybe it's bitterness. Holy Spirit, speak to them right now. You are set free from that. Whatever thought that's coming to your mind right now, that curse that's coming to your mind right now, please know that you're set free from that. Jesus set you free. He paid the redemptive price for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship team, let's close it down, Ryan. Whatever you feel the Spirit's moving you to do. If you need to pray today, if you need to come up here and, and bow down before your God today, and again, maybe you need to come down here and submit your life to Christ. Maybe you need to apply the blood for the first time. There's people, we've got prayer people here, around here all over the place that are not here to embarrass you, but they're here to pray with you. Okay, if you're in this place today and you've been struggling with sickness, you've been struggling with bitterness, hatred, you've been struggling with the things that you've been set free from, today you can be set free. Again, if you want to come forward, we've got all kinds of people that would come right here and pray with you to, to help confirm your testimony that you are set free. So again, as the worship team begins to play, pr play and to pray, uh, don't hold back. Just come down here and let us pray with you. Th this is what the New Covenant Church is all about. If there's anybody that's sick, let them lay their hands upon the sick that they shall be healed. We have redemption in our hands. So worship team, let's begin to play.